Um, um, <clears throat> they are, they tend to be a little bit more intuitive, I think, uh, a little safer in the sense that they're built to be a little more restrictive, a, a Mac I'm speaking of, um, in terms of just kind of spyware and a lot of the things we're going to talk about today. Generally speaking, they're a little bit safer than a Windows machine, which is a little bit more open um, and not easily uh, accessible or, or, or problematic um, from, a, from a spyware perspective, but, but sort of. Um, so, you know, both are great. I use a Windows machine. I also use a Mac. So I kind of interchangeably use both. Um, Macs tend to be a little more expensive for sure, but um, hardware wise, they last for a very long time. And again, they are, I'll say, safer from a, a perspective of, um, of internet browsing and spyware and viruses and things like that. You don't see a lot of that on Macs. They're not an easy target. <clears throat> and then in the phone world, you obviously have iPhone, which is the primary uh, largest market share is iPhones, and then Androids, <clears throat> two smartphones. Uh, that's really it. There's two flavors. There's many brands of, of uh, Android, Samsung being the largest. Um, but they all run the same operating system, which is the uh, Android operating system. And then you have iPhone, which has, over the last like five years, iPhone has surpassed Android in terms of market share. Um, so either of those are really the only smartphones out there at this point. Um, within each of them though, you can run the same things, right? So you can run an application that is on both iPhone or Android. And the one I'll talk about is like a web browser, right? You can download a web browser on either phone, that's the same. And it might be the same browser that you use on your Windows computer or Mac computer. So even though we have Windows, we have Mac, we have iPhone, we have Android. And in many ways, the same applications are available on all of them. They all kind of feel the same at the end of the day. So it's really just personal preference in terms of what you like and what you're used to. Um, in terms of, you know, internet access, right? So what do we use the internet for? Email is obviously a big, a big one, um, but also web browsing, right? So, I mean, at this point, I think many of probably everybody on this call even to some degree uses the internet maybe most days or every day um, i certainly do um, all of my news comes from the web i don't have a i don't subscribe to a traditional deliver paper for example um, social media is how i keep up with family and friends and things like that uh, banking for sure for myself is all done online um, credit card payments. I mean, just kind of literally everything, um, right? That's many reasons why we access the internet. Um, well, also similar reasons to why it can be dangerous, right? Because if you're used to doing online banking, for example, um, <clears throat> that is a place that scammers, right? Or fraudsters, we want to call them, um, are targeting because they want your banking information, for example, um, things like that. And we're going to talk about all that. Um, as we go through this. Um, also games, that's another huge one. Um, everything is kind of free these days, right? So online games are free. Um, everything is ad driven, right? They're, these games are paid for by ad revenue. So you will see in many cases when you're game, playing games online, free games, uh, you have to deal with ads or, or end or, you can pay to remove those ads, right? And to gain features. One thing that is true is with game ads, you can get into weird places on the internet that you don't wanna be by clicking on the wrong thing within a game ad um, or an ad on any site really, but games are a big one because that's, that's how they actually make any revenue is by, these, uh, by ad selling. Um, but oftentimes you can click on an ad in a game that looks legitimate and and seems like you should be clicking there and you're not really supposed to and they you know they kind of get you right and then suddenly you're in a you're in a website you don't want to be on and uh, maybe asking for information from you that you'd never intended to share right so those are kind of some some things to kind of uh, just keep in mind when we talk about like online anything really it's it's ads but especially when you talk about games and um, news sites who generate it. The only way they generate revenue oftentimes is ads. Uh, job listings, banking, same thing. So just kind of be wary of uh, of when, how, and why you know you could be targeted. Um, a lot of that is common sense, right? So it's like think before you click, read the website address carefully, um, and then when in doubt, directly visit a site or contact through establish means. So what that means is, let's just give an example. Uh, you're playing a game. Um, 
somehow you you get to a site that maybe is asking you for to input your personal information right you have to just think to yourself like what why is that why did that happen it probably is not legitimate right so again it's common sense right so uh, think before you click right first of all but if you do get somewhere that you're not sure how why you got to a place it's probably not legitimate and it's probably them targeting gaining your personal information for one reason or another um or worse right so like a big part of using the internet safely is just having common sense um you can safely browse the internet and and get to places you shouldn't be but as long as you know not to continue once you're there um, or give any personal information, um, you know, close out of that, back up, go back to the site you were on, for example. Um, all right, and when in doubt, this says directly visit the site. So if if you if you click something and and you're like, wow, how did I get to uh, Citibank, for example? You know, how did I get here? Why is why are they asking for my for my uh, name and, and address and things like that? Maybe maybe back up and say, do is this really where I want to be? Right, look at this example. This looks like Facebook. I don't know, you guys can probably all see this, right? It's not. It's a different website that kind of is made to look like Facebook. So if you got to this page, for example, you might think, oh, I'm on Facebook. Well, the reality is you're not. And you wouldn't know that unless you looked up here in this, in this top bar, which is the actual website. And so what would happen here is you'd be asked for your login information. And so you could put your login information here on this site. And now whoever is owning this site has your login information for Facebook. And I'm going to assume many of you have at least know a person who may have told you or you've seen online, my Facebook's been hacked. Please don't you know, respond to any messages from me or whatever it may be. This is a perfect example of how that could happen. So you get to a page that is made to look exactly like a common website like Facebook, it's a huge one. You log in by giving your information. Now they have on record your username and password. So perfect example of you know a scary place that you didn't intend to get to, right? But somehow through maybe an ad on a on a game over here, you got to this page and suddenly you're turning over your uh, your information without even realizing it. Um, Let's talk about safety guidelines a bit. So, you know, what, how do you protect yourself, right? In terms of um, just being safe, um, updating your computer or device. So that's that's a big one. It's I'll say it's an easy one because the manufacturers and, and, and operating system um, creators like Microsoft and uh, Apple and Android, they push updates pretty often and oftentimes they're their security updates that's the largest kind of reason why updates are so common and frequent you know features are also part of updates but oftentimes it's security updates so on an iphone for example um, you'll get a notification that says an update is available um, it will be installed like overnight when your phone's plugged in typically that's how apple does it I think Android's the same thing. Um, Windows, again, tries to do it overnight when you're not using your computer as long as it's left on. I would encourage you all to always accept those and you and install them, right? There's not really any good reason I can give you not to install an update um, for home personal use, especially. Um, in a business environment, oftentimes or sometimes Microsoft will release an update that could break something else, like a piece of software, but uh, for home use, that's not really common. And in home cases, usually you're just using the internet anyway. You're not really using a lot of applications. So keep your devices up to date. Um, it's easy to do these days. The, these folks want you to update because they want to keep you safe. The uh, the, manu the, the uh, software operators, the operating system operators. Um, so I would encourage you all to make sure you do keep up to date on those. Uh, in terms of a rep reputable web browser, right? So I guess... Whether you know it or not, to use the web, you have to use a, what's called a web browser. It's really just a piece of software. Um, natively, when you buy an iPhone, it comes with a web browser called Safari. That's an Apple um, product that they build. And it comes on every iPhone. Android comes with Chrome, Google Chrome, which is a, uh, it's a Google product. Google is the uh, creator of Android. 
um, and they want you using their product, Chrome. Um, Safari is not listed on here, but Safari is fine. Chrome is fine. There's another product called Firefox, which is unrelated to these guys, but it's another uh, third party. Um, safe, you know, safe to use, safe web browser. Edge is a Microsoft product, again, safe to use. Um, you should be using one of these, right? We shouldn't be using, there's a laundry list of other um, browsers out there. There are some other ones that are good that aren't listed here, but you know, I would encourage you to use Chrome. I'm gonna give that as my kind of example. That's what I use every day. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's faster, I'll say, than most browsers, but it's also safe and it's constantly being updated for you know, security reasons. So um, just make sure you're using a good, a good reputable web browser. Um, in terms of passwords for anything you're doing, um, first of all, passwords should be, you know, unique and memorable. Um, I, I would say oftentimes I know it's challenging to always have a unique password, um, but I typically try to use a name um, or a word, I'll say, of something that is maybe linked to me in some way um, and then append uh, numbers to it and usually a special character or two. So. An example I'll give, it's not a real password of mine, but you know, um, maybe a car model, a year and an exclamation point, right? So uh, Honda 2007 exclamation point or something like that, right? So you wanna have a, a combination of letters, numbers and a special character. And typically an uppercase or two would be useful too in there somewhere. Um, so, and, and memorable, that's really the, the important thing because oftentimes we forget passwords, myself included. Um, the other thing is, and many of you probably know about this, and if you don't, this would be a good time to learn about it. It's called two-factor authentication. So generally speaking, banking sites almost always enforce this, um, but so you probably run across it if you do online banking. But basically what it says is you might know the password to get into a, an account, but we're also going to authenticate you another methodology, right? So it will also say, you need to tell us your cell phone number to, because we're gonna send you a text message code each time you log in. And the advantage to that is that if someone steals your password and they log in as you, they, they can't get in without that code that you'd be sent to your phone. And they wouldn't have access to that because it would be still sent to your phone, right? So. Let's say that um, my email um, and password got it exposed. Somebody stole it from my, my bank. <clears throat> they would try to log in and I would get a text on my phone saying, um, here's your, here's your one time, you know, six digit passcode or pin number. Um, now, if I didn't log in, I would clearly realize I have a problem that somebody has my password. Um, but the good news is they wouldn't get in because they don't have the code. I can now log in and change my password, right? So if you're, you should kind of always be using two-factor authentication. But in addition to that, um, if you get a notification of a PIN for a site you're not currently logging into, you're just going about your day, that's a pretty good indication that somebody has your password and you should go in there and change it immediately or as soon as you can. Um, so that's two-factor authentication. You'll also hear it be referred to as multi-factor authentication. The, the whole point of it is you set up another means of then confirming it's you. <clears throat> and each time you log in, um, it's gonna also authenticate through that other means. Usually a cell phone text is the, uh, the simplest way of doing it. There are other methodologies, but cell phone text is easy and most sites um, allow for that. Um, antivirus software. <clears throat> so when we're talking about Windows devices. There is built-in antivirus in these days since Windows 10 or maybe even 7 came out. Um, I wouldn't suggest you have anything beyond that. The built-in stuff is, is, is pretty good now. Um, Mac OS, um, kind of similarly, but even more so. Again, like a much even more safe um, platform to be on. Um, not to say it's impenetrable or anything like that, but um, just generally speaking, Macs are a little bit uh, less targeted because they're more restrictive and locked down. So pretty safe um, opportunity to use is Mac OS. Um, in terms of cell phones, um, iPhones that are similar to Mac in the sense that they're, they're pretty tightly restricted and locked down. Android's more open. Um, I, I don't hear a lot of, uh, you know, 
folks getting viruses on, a, on their phones, but they do exist. Um, so be mindful just as you would on a computer, right? Because, because the overwhelming popularity of mobile devices, tablets and phones, they become targets for um, nefarious folks, right? Because if people are not using computers anymore, they're gonna, and they're using uh, tablets and phones, they become the target because there's more people using them. Um, <clears throat> human factors, right? So social engineering, lying to or tricking a person. So that really comes down to things that, again, kind of look like they're real, but they're not. Perfect example I'll give you guys, a personal example is many years ago, I was um, <clears throat> operating a restaurant actually, and we got a call from what sound, a phone call, which from what sounded like Pico. And it sounded like they were going to, Pico is a, a utility company, sorry, a electric company. Um, they indicated they were going to shut, shut off the service and it was like a Friday evening. I was horrified at this and I didn't really stop to think, well, that doesn't make any sense because the bill is paid but I didn't. And they had instructed me to go buy gift cards uh, and then give those gift card and then gift card information to them over the phone. I didn't actually do it, thankfully. I kind of came to my senses while I was thinking through this, but it's they had lied and tried to trick me right into doing that. And there have been a few examples of this actually occurring um, that I know of even you know, within the company uh, where somebody has done that. And, and some of the examples are, you get an email that looks like it's from someone you know, but it's not really. And they ask you to do something. Generally, it's buy a gift card of sorts because once that gift card is purchased, it's as good as cash, basically. Um, so that's kind of a thing. So just be be mindful of like lie, being lied to or tricked, and you don't necessarily know you're being tricked, obviously. But if you if you just think it sounds a little fishy, let's say that that happened again to me. What I would probably do is hang up the phone and call the utility company directly and ask them. It takes two minutes and I would be able to confirm or deny that that person was um, fake or not, right? So that's kind of what this bullet point is. Always verify the source and contact the company or directly. Because if I hung up the phone right then and there and just called Pico, within probably two minutes, they would have realized everything was actually perfectly fine and that was, that was a scam. Um, and so the components of the scam are generally this, right? Create a sense of urgency. We're going to cut your power off. So, you know, you better go buy gift cards. Uh, threat of loss, you know, again, turning the power off. Um, hyperlinks to malicious websites. So if this is a web scam, I'm, I'm describing a phone scam if it was a web scam. Um, oftentimes you'll get a link, right? And that link will look uh, real. Um, but when you hover over a link, I'll, I'll try and show you before we wrap up here today, um, it'll show you the actual site it's going to. So if it says click here to go to, you know, pay your bill at Pico, for example, if you hover over that and the website it's actually taking you to is some random name, like a random, clearly not Pico, for example, or if let's say it was Facebook or something, that's a pretty good indication that it's not real and, it, you know, it should, should be just trashed. Um, unexpected attachments, unusual sender language grammar. This is a pretty good, this last bullet is a good giveaway. I get a lot of emails from folks in the company who say, hey, this look, is this a real email or not a real email? And generally speaking, I don't even have to look into it beyond reading the way that it's written um, to know it's fake or not, right? So if <clears throat> usually they try to, it's called spoofing, right? So someone might say, want to, pretend to be me, for example, John Weibel. So they'll send an email from, um, they can spoof my name and say they're John Weibel, right? There's nothing stopping anybody from setting up a fake email account with somehow using the name John Weibel on it. And they'll send an email to somebody who works here who might know me and say, I need you to buy you know, three gift cards for Best Buy and send them to me ASAP, right? Um, but usually it's kind of written weirdly. Um, the language and the grammar is kind of strange oftentimes, and it just doesn't make a lot of logical sense. And that's why I say you can usually just kind of, without digging into it too much, figure that out just from looking at the email. Is, it, is, the per, is the person that's sending it to you that it's supposed to be, is that how they normally talk? Is that how they normally speak and type? Generally, you can kind of, you know, figure this stuff out without even thinking more beyond than just, just that alone. Um, 
the other thing I would say is validate it, right? So let's say that somebody like myself said, asked you to go buy gift cards. Well, maybe just call me and say, hey, I got this email from you um, to go buy gift cards. Did, I, did you really send that? And within a second, I would say, no, nope, that wasn't me. That's fake. And then you delete the email and be done with it. Um, all right, so let's talk about phishing, right? So <clears throat> phishing is is kind of, phishing is called phishing because it's you know phishing like a fishing rod. Basically, oh, am I muted again? Can you guys hear? Can you hear me, Lonnie? Thumbs up if you can. Yeah, oh, okay. Somebody said they can't hear. Um, <clears throat> okay, so phishing, right? So it's trying to target people via email, telephone, text message. Um, posing as a real company person to try and get information from you, right? So, and phishing, they're literally sending this to maybe the same thing to hundreds or thousands of people in hopes of a few of them responding with real info, right? Because if you send this thing, just cast your net to a thousand uh, fish, we'll say, and four, um, four give you their info, that's a success, right? So, you know, that's why it's called phishing. Um, and then the information is, of course, then used to access important accounts. Um, bank information, credit card information, passwords, that's the, that's the, the information they want, right? And so um, if somebody comes asking you for any of this, you just have to stop and think to yourself, like, why, right? There's really, ne there's never a situation where somebody is going to email you legitimately and ask you for information like, um, a password, for example, just nobody's doing that. No bank is ever going to do that. Um, it's just not really a thing. And if you did get an email from, let's say Chase Bank is your bank, and they email, you get an email that appears to look legitimate and they want you to uh, log into their site for some reason, right? I wouldn't click the link in the email. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but, uh, or, you know, validate that it really is Chase's site by hovering over it and seeing what the real website is. But realistically, that's probably not a real email that's gonna happen, but if it does happen, go to Chase website directly yourself by just typing it in and logging in. Don't follow the uh, link in the email because that's just, a, it could be used nefariously to, um, to make it appear like it's a real site, it's actually not. Um, so types of phishing or email, and I, that's just kind of an unfortunate at this point, email is, is I get hundreds of emails a day because my emails existed for, I don't know, 20 years on my Gmail account. And so it's just kind of out there and people just hammer it. And Gmail is pretty good about filtering out junk, but stuff still gets through. Uh, voice calls. I can't stress how many, I get probably, I don't know why, but probably five to seven calls a day that are maybe not fraud, but they're, they're spam or phishing, right? And it's really bad now. I don't know if anybody else experiences that lately, but in the last six months, it's gotten worse. Um, and then text, not as common for me personally, but um, text is obviously another medium people use to, again, once again, fish. Um, other types of scams, kind of more traditional, I'll say, are website pop-ups. That is a big one. Um, You'll go to a free game is a perfect example of where you just see that a lot. You'll, you'll be playing a free game online and there are so many ads in those games because that's how they pay for things that you'll click on something that says click here and suddenly you're off into another world, like getting into a place you don't want to be. Um, unwanted software install, that is related because in some cases those website pop-ups bring you to places that um, ultimately ask you to do things like install a piece of software that it says you need, but you don't need, or download this antivirus piece of software, you know, but this, it's actually not legitimate. Um, and they, under the guise of it's, it's going to help you, right? But it's really not, it's really there to hurt you. Um, websites asking to allow notifications. So you'll see on a lot of uh, sites these days, when you visit them, there will be a pop-up that will say allow or block for notifications. They want you to press allow because what that will allow it to do is it'll allow you to send you alerts without you even being on the website. I block those in every case actually, because I don't really want that. I don't need that notification to tell me 
about a news alert, for example, news sites are pretty pretty uh, insistent on asking you that. Um, but nefarious websites are also um, asking that. So I would say as a rule, unless you have a really good reason, um, I would always block notifications from websites. <clears throat> um, how to protect yourself. So here are just some, some real, I'd say basic fundamental things to do to, to keep yourself safe in terms of um, how to protect yourself. So do not click links in an email. That's, that's a big one. Um, there are definitely times where you, you unfortunately will have to click link in an email. If you, I'll give an example of that. So I'm not just kind of giving the two conflicting pieces of information. If you um, go to a website, for example, and they want to auth authenticate or say that, confirm that you are who you say you are, right? So you log in to chase.com. Chase might say, please go to your email and click the link we just sent to you to validate that that's you. And you might have to go do that and that's real. But if you get an email kind of blindly, randomly from a company, a bank, a, kind of anyone that asks you to click something, I, almost, I can't really even think of a time where that's legitimate, right? So unless you're expecting the email with a link, don't click on it, right? It's, it's probably bad, it's probably bad news. Um, never provide your personal information or passwords, right? There's there's almost, there's never a case where a company, a legitimate company is gonna email you um, asking you to input your information, personal information somewhere, right? That happens when you log into a site and it might say your password's expired, right? Put a new one in, that's fine. That's that's very normal, but it's never, no one's ever gonna email you saying, hey, you know, uh, please, give me your information, it's just not a legitimate um, mechanism that they use for doing that. Um, and phishing success relies on you providing the sensitive info, right? So it's really, you're kind of like the first and last line of defense, right? In terms of um, not providing information. And I would say, you know, again, common sense is honestly the most important thing here. It is, you can, you can be a hundred percent successful really and not, um, you know, succumbing to phishing attempts by just using your common sense. And even if you get to a, a site, let's say you accidentally click on this uh, link that you shouldn't have clicked on, but you didn't realize it at the time, just close it out. Just close out the site and go back to what you were doing, right? There's no harm in, in, in most cases, there's no harm in getting there, but just don't provide the information, right? Just close the site out and be done with it. Um, providing personal details, passwords, account information, or computer access is a problem, right? So we just, it's, it's uh, kind of multifaceted, right? So the one, one thing is personal passwords, right? That's, that's an easy one that we definitely don't want to give up. But account information is another one. Computer access, just horrifying. I've heard stories of this where someone asks you for permission to access your computer under the guise of you have a virus, I need to help you, right? So the, so the types of, um, or the type of thing that will happen is you might get a call on your phone, you're not even on your, your computer, and they'll say that it's the IRS or something and you have a, there's a problem, we need to access your computer. And they give you instructions on how to give them access to your computer, right? That is something that's very real. It does happen and it's really bad because what they'll do at that point is try to get access to anything that you've ever, any password you've ever saved, any personal information you have saved into your, um, into your computer, they'll, they'll have access to it all at that point. So, you know, beyond providing information, giving them just straight up computer access is not good. Microsoft will never call you to ask you to, to, to help you. No one will ever proactively call your phone and say, you have a problem, I need access to your computer to fix it. That is not a real thing. And so if you get that call, just hang up on them. Um, it's good because 100% of the time it's, it's fake and it's, it's somebody who's trying to steal from you basically. Um, and go to the source site directly, the website directly. And that's really as it pertains to, um, let's say a phishing email where it says, hi, like, I am Netflix and your account's on hold, for example, right? As you see in the picture here. Well, you know, maybe that's legit. Pro I would say probably not. Your best bet, just go to netflix.com and log in and see what happens <laughs> because 
the proof's in the pudding, right? If you can log into the site that you've navigated to, you're probably fine. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, I'll go back to the Pico electric um, stitching attempt that happened to me. If I just called Pico, I would have been done with it and, and moved on with my life. Instead, I spent 30 minutes worrying about electric being cut off to a business, right? And that was just silly of me to, to not do that. But in the moment, you're worried and you you want to resolve the issue. Um, and so, you know, but again, going to the root is really the most important thing. Um, here's an email example. So let's talk about this, right? So do not click links in an email, right? And and this, again, I don't want to say that every time you get a link in an email, it's bad. It's not necessarily the case. If you're expecting a link, that's fine, right? You, if, if you go to a website and they say, hey, we just sent you an email. Can you please go confirm that it's you by clicking the link in it? That's legitimate and that's fine. But if you blindly get an email from a person or a company that it has a link in it for you to click, it's likely not a legitimate um, email and link. Um, and go to the source site directly. Here's a good example of oops, where someone has sent an email that appears to be this person. And actually, this is an old example. This is, um, you know, you actually no longer works here, but this is a real person that worked at Cherry Hill Programs. Um, the name, but you can see the email is not his email. It's not his Cherry Hill email, I can tell you that. Um, it's a random email at a random company, I'll say, optimum.net, um, that appears to come from this person who, if you saw this person emailing you, you might think, oh, well, that's important. I need to get back to him or do what he says, right? Well, here's what he says. I'd like to change the direct deposit information for my paycheck. Right, so that's no good. If we fought, if whoever received this followed it through on this, they would potentially just be turning over their direct deposit, their bank information to whoever DJ Shallow Two is. Right, that email, and this is not fake. This is actually a real email that came in. This is last year sometime. So it's a perfect example of anybody can call themselves a name, but the underlying email account or the email might not be real. It's just something you made up in some. John Smith made up online and he's, he knows this person's name and he might know that you work here. So therefore I'm going to send an email to all the people I, I, I emails I know of people who work at this company and, and think that I'm Ed, right? So really good example of, uh, of a scary uh, phishing attempt. But if somebody sent this to me, I would say, yeah, that's, that's no good. And I can tell you that because this email is random. It's not real. So if um, one of you guys have a, a son or daughter and you get an email that says their name, make sure that the email, the actual email is them, right? And you know what? You could call them and say, hey, I got an email from you about direct deposit info. And they'd say, no, that's, that's, that wasn't for me. I didn't send that, right? And at that point, you can just delete it and be done with it. So hopefully that makes sense. But this is a perfect example of what I've been kind of talking about this whole time, which is this phishing. <clears throat> um, so here's an example of, and this, this is pretty common these days, so I get these a lot, um, an email that has um, a link to files, right? So in this case, it can look pretty legitimate. So here's an email on the right, and it says it's from this person's name or email at cherryhillprograms.com. They sent you some files, right? And like, seems pretty harmless. The note is FYI, get back ASAP with views. And there's a link here, it says get your files. So like what I would do if I, if I received this to say, am I waiting on files from this person? If I am, this why are they sending it this way? That's not how we usually operate. So this seems kind of weird. Um, and I'd probably just ask myself a couple of those questions. And on, at the end of the day, like I would, in, immediately, I would have recognized this as being not real. But if you didn't, this is this is not real. And I would confirm with the person that whoever this name was, right? We blurred it out. But let's say it was John Smith. I would call John Smith and say, hey, I got a link from you about um, some files you need me to look at. And they would quickly tell you that, yeah, that wasn't me. That's spam, right? So anybody can, can do make something like this where they put in an email body uh, a real email address, right? And a link to something that's that's nefarious. Maybe you click this and you go somewhere that some, somewhere along the line is gonna ask for like your, some login information or something. 
Um, so this is another good example of like a real, a real email that exists in, you know, even today we see this kind of stuff. Um, and the common sense can hopefully get you to the point where you don't click it and actually give these folks what they're looking for. So the sanity check is, yeah, do I know this person? Sure, I do know this person. Am I expecting files from them? Uh, no, and this is, you know, that's not how we normally share files. Why are they, sh what is this, right? So again, like common sense kind of tells you the answer. Uh, next thing I wanna talk about, and this is pretty straightforward. It's just email setup. Um, I would encourage a Gmail account. That's the preferred email that I have used for a very long time. Um, it's pretty commonplace. It's definitely, I want to say it's the largest provider of personal email. Um, so, you know, many of you probably have a Gmail. Many of you uh, probably, if not Gmail, have, uh, I think I see a lot of like Yahoo, AOL even still. Um, a lot of providers like Comcast will give you an email account. Um, I always would kind of suggest that you don't use a, an internet provider email account as your permanent email account. And the reason I say that is because let's say you have Comcast service right now, right? And you have a Comcast email. You're kind of bound to that email forever when you start setting it up with banking information and things like that. Well, what happens when you leave Comcast? I think they might let you keep it. I'm not sure on that, but the point is you want to kind of be in an agnostic world of, of email and Gmail has no ties to any other service that you have, right? Like a internet service. Um, <clears throat> Gmail obviously wants your email because they want to know everything that everybody's doing all the time. So they can make money on search engine uh, things. But that being said, the product is, I think one of the best ones are the best one. Um, and they're pretty good about filtering out spam because they, they see so much email every day, every minute. They have a pretty good grasp on what's real and what's not and, and hiding the stuff that's not real from you. Not to say it's perfect, but um, I'm just I'm just going on to say that you know it's it's definitely the one I would recommend. So to make a Gmail account, um, you open up a web browser. So again it might be Safari, Firefox, Chrome, I prefer Chrome, um, but you can use any of those. Go to gmail.com, not search. And, and I'll talk about this for one second here. Um, oftentimes I talk to people and ask them to navigate to a website over the phone and they search for the website. So what they actually do is they don't go to gmail.com. They actually search a web browser for gmail.com or Gmail. And that's okay, but it's not, I'm gonna try and bring an example up here to, to show what I mean. Um, you know, you guys see the screen that says you've gone incognito. Yeah. So if I were to um, want to go to, uh, I don't know, a website, um, ESPN, right, dot com, oftentimes people will just type that and they hit enter. And now I actually didn't go to ESPN.com. I searched for it. And now I have search results, right? You see how we have these search results here? Um, that's not necessarily wrong, but it's not really what I meant to do. I meant to go to ESPN.com and hit enter. And now I'm actually on the website. So those are two very different things. And the reason why I bring it up is because if I were to search for Gmail, uh, that's not a good example because there's no ads, but um, I'm gonna use some really weird specific examples here. Um, the short of it is, if you search for a term or a website instead of going to the website itself, you're, you're going to have to find the actual link you want down here, right? If someone at home tells you, hey, I need, could you go to yahoo.com? That's where you should be, right? You don't want to be searching for Yahoo and then having to sort through results and click on results, right? Those are two very different things. So I'm bringing it up because when we talk about go to gmail.com, this is literally what I mean, go to gmail.com and then create an account, enter your personal information, which is the screenshot I have over there, um, and then follow through the steps, right? And then suddenly you have a Gmail account um, and you can start using it immediately. Um, I would say, you know, Gmail has been around for 20 years. A lot of times nowadays, at least people's names are kind of taken because this is a shared resource, right? In the sense that there can only be 
one John Weibel at gmail.com, for example. So um, you might find your name is taken, even your full name. So I would encourage you can search and you can put in like um, numbers, right? If you wanted to put in like a birth year or something to try and get one that's as close as you can to your name. So just be aware of that, the fact that it's been around for long enough that a lot of names are taken, even unique names. Um, and then, you know, once you log in, you can go ahead and add your email to your smartphone. Every iPhone and Android has an option just to add a Gmail to it really simply. And then you can access email on your phone. All right, that is actually everything. Uh, I think I'm on time, that's good. So I guess good time for questions and answers. So 